As the chairman has said, you have a copy of a draft communique. Um, this version is quite long. Um, it tries to look at the background on what we mean by migration and the different types of migration, to pick up many of the points that have been made today about things like the social determinants, the health generally, um, the impact on the countries like uh, this country, which have large numbers of people either transiting through them or staying for long periods of time, and so on. And it finishes with a series of recommendations. Now, without any apology, those recommendations are quite tough. They have uh, quite a lot of political uh, comment in them. Um, and at the end of the day, a communique from a conference is what the conference wants it to say. If the conference feels that there are elements in there that are too strong, or indeed too weak, uh, then it's over to you to help us to change them. One of the reasons why it's taken a while to get onto the, um, onto the board here is that I've been amending it during the day to add in extra words that have been considered by uh, different people, uh, some of the recommendations that have been made in terms of language, about the way in which we talk about uh, refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, IDPs, and so on, um, and to try to make sure that what we are, what, what I've tried to capture is what people have been saying today. So you have the original text without those amendments in front of you. Um, there is quite a lot of criticism of different groups within the within both the body of the document and the recommendations. Uh, two particular groups who I've pulled out for criticism have been the media, because I think it's fair to say that the media in many of our countries have demonized, and I liked the use of the, the word demonized by the last speaker, I think it's a very important word, many of the um, migrant groups of different sorts. And also governments, because many of our governments, and I will admit here that the United Kingdom government has been one of the worst in this situation, have not been generous, warm, welcoming, inclusive to migrants. Um, we've had a better history than we have currently. Uh, our current government is not, is not warm and cuddly towards people who are migrating, and nor do they understand the reasons. So you'll see in the document that I've spelt out many of the reasons for migration. So one of the areas that you may want to look at is that I, I make the point um, that migrants, regardless of the reason that they become migrants, uh, are all looking for something better. They're trying to improve their lot in life. They're trying to make their life safer for their children, their family, themselves. And, and that's equally true of what we sometimes call, disparagingly, economic migrants. You know, economic migrants are people living in the sort of poverty that none of us have experienced and trying very hard to provide a life for their children in particular, very often it's families, where there is an opportunity for better education, for better jobs, for better housing, and so on. And the question, therefore, is you know, how do we make it how do we make our countries more welcoming to people who seek to improve their lot? Um, most of our countries, all of our countries, have a history of migration, and most of the migrants that came to our countries in the past were economic migrants in some way. If you think of the United States of America, which was a country which has completely built itself on migration, or Israel more recently than that, or other countries, many of these people have migration for economic reasons. So one of the questions for you is, are we going to look um, at all migrants for different reasons, or are we going to differentiate discriminate between those who move for economic reasons and those who move because there is a war in their home country or there's been a massive natural event which has made that their housing and jobs and so on have disappeared, have collapsed. Uh, and I think we need to recognize that and to, to ask the question, what do we want to include in this? 
the part of our decision might be on how we're going to use this communique at the end of this period. And one of the ways in which we would like to use it at the WMA is as the beginning of a process which starts to get all the medical associations in membership engaged in this issue, so that all of us feel able, empowered if you want, to talk to our governments, to talk to, uh, with working with NGOs and other groups to say, how can we improve the situation? How can we stop that demonization and instead produce a humanity which recognizes the difficulty that uh, people who are migrating feel uh, and experience, and indeed that actually encompasses what we feel as doctors about how we try to um, make sure that people are treated without unfair discrimination. The whole of medical life we spend discriminating, but we discriminate fairly. We discriminate on the basis of need and on nothing else. And it's really important that we try to build that in. That's not the way most of our governments are currently dealing with that. Um, if I can, could roll down the, what was there, until we get to the first bit of red. I hope it comes up in red on this as well. Uh, looking at the moment like it's not going to. There's, there should be something in the first paragraph and it seems to have lost that. It should have the new... Anyway, never mind. I'll let me read through what I'm doing. At the very beginning, at the end of the preamble, I've added in a new paragraph or a new sentence which says, the crisis, because there was discussion of the word crisis this morning, the crisis emerges from the unwillingness or lack of preparedness of states to properly and humanely respond to the needs of current mass migration events. And I think it's important to use the word crisis, unless you tell me I must remove it, because it's, that's the way it's being described by the media and by governments. So what I have tried to do, and I'm sorry, there are actually two versions on the memory stick, possibly two version fours, 4A, look for 4A. Um, the, the, the point being that I'm trying to define crisis as the crisis exists simply because we have not been prepared to help people when there are large numbers needing to migrate at one time. Right, we seem to have got the right version now because it's got some sidelining. The second one um, is under uh, why is there a crisis? And I've just added in again a clause that says that the numbers of events, climate events, natural events, continuing poverty, warfare, and so on, lead to mass migration events, which we're responding to with a mixture of panic and discrimination. And again, I'm trying to emphasize that as doctors, we see, we spend our lives trying to deal with events as they occur. And that means being adaptable, but somehow our governments have not been as adaptable as they need to be to actually deal humanely with mass migration events. Um, if I go on, there's then quite a long area in which there are no changes, but if we go to the recommendations, if we could, which are on page, I think, seven, or no, just before that, the political dialogue. I've added in, because there's been some discussion of the issue of peacemaking, um, and I've added in, in that section, this sentence, peace must be sought as an end in itself, not simply as a means of reducing the number of refugees. A short-sighted approach to peace is unlikely to find a lasting solution. I think it's really important, it came out of several speakers today, particularly this morning, that when governments seek peace, because if we have peace, we'll reduce the numbers of refugees and therefore we won't have to treat people well. What we get from that is any solution will work. What we don't get is a solution that looks at the hopes, the needs, the expectations, the rights of all the people involved in that conflict and comes to a solution which everyone will feel treats them fairly or as fairly as other people. 
And that's incredibly important if we're to have sustainable peace. All of us want to see peace in, throughout the world, but sustainable peace is a very difficult thing to obtain if politicians do it for the wrong reasons. So the recommendations, which start at the top of page seven, Um, and these recommendations, if we can keep rolling it up to page, top of page seven. Yep. Yeah. The point about the recommendations is the intent here is to give a focus to what medical associations will do. There's a number of medical associations here and to try to define where we see as doctors the problems uh, and where we see, therefore, some of the solutions. And the recommendations do, to a certain extent, build upon each other. And I do hope everyone will take the opportunity to read them. If we go up to number four, um, it hasn't included all the new words. I put it, some new words in here. Oh, it, it is in there, but it's, it's somehow lost the colouring. Where you see the first red line on the side, if you look across to the right, the sentence that starts in English, it must also include, is a new sentence. So it must also include treating migrants, including at borders, with respect, ensuring that their dignity is not affected. And, this comes back again to something that's been said several times. Part of the problem that we are facing at the moment is with these large numbers of people, they're often being treated as a block. Not as human beings somehow, but just something which must be moved around or stopped from moving. Uh, and that ignores the essential fact that these are human beings and that they have a right to respect and dignity. Uh, and I think that that is something which doctors can say very strongly. Um, and it includes the sentences before that, which were in before, about providing safe transit routes, safe places to stay, uh, secure facilities, whether they're in transit or have reached a final, their final destination country. And it goes on to say immediately after that about um, adequate provision for drinkable water, food, sewerage, shelter, and so on must be made, and that people planning for these migrant populations must take adequate public health advice to, to in planning and delivering the facilities. The other new sentence here is mass detention of refugees is at best undesirable. If it is essential, it must be based upon the provision of excellent living facilities, including opportunities for safe play areas and education opportunities for children. I think it's important to separate out the children uh, in the language because at the moment one of the things that I think we're seeing, and I've heard it in several speeches today, is th the needs of children can get lost. They can just become, you know, some another person. And yet we all know as doctors that if children don't have safe play areas, generally secure housing, food, and all the rest of it as well, which all of the family need, but they need safe play areas. And they also need the opportunity to learn. Um, children only, you know, we only have one childhood. It's a limited time to learn and develop. So that's why I've added in that language from this morning. The end of paragraph six, if we can just roll it up a little bit. There's some more new language, it's just over the page, that's it. That's a new sentence that begins the idea. Um, and again, this paragraph is about this meeting um, commending, saying how good the welcome given to refugees, asylum seekers, and other migrants in some countries has been, and deplores the reluctance to offer help and support in many other countries. Development of barriers is not a solution. We've heard again today, building a wall or a, um, a fence or raise a wire is not a solution. And again, the point has been made several times that if you treat migrants well, there will be more. 
is a nonsense. So we should, I've said that, but I've said it the opposite way around. The idea that treating migrants harshly will discourage future migrants is both absurd and inhumane. And I don't mind whether, if you want to change that, the question is whether it is the absurdity of it which makes us condemn it, or the inhumanity. I think it's the inhumanity more than anything else. But it is also absurd, because governments will not always do the right thing, the thing that isn't inhumane, if they think that what they're doing is work, will work. And that's why I put that it's absurd. It's quite clear that it isn't going to work. Uh, the, the reasons for people moving are so much worse. The conditions they're coming from are usually so much worse, and they see no future hope. People don't become migrants lightly. They don't become migrants without thinking it through. And those are the only changes I've made to the document that you have before me. Um, clearly, if this is to go out, if this is to become a document that the WMA will use, that all the medical associations in the room will use, and others, um, to help to talk to their governments, to talk to the bigger than individual government groups who are looking at the migration issues uh, and trying to find a solution. You know, we want to be there as doctors to, to help shape that debate. Um, we had the challenge to, to join the MSF campaign. This is a part of it. This is something that we can do. But it has to be something you're comfortable with. It has to be something which you feel will give you language that you can use um, and that you can help to develop and use as the basis for future actions. So it's really over to you. We won't agree it now. We would agree it if we do agree it tomorrow. So you have 24 hours. You have overnight to look at it. You can talk about it over dinner tonight at the gala. Um, you can argue about it. Great. And what I would really like is uh, people to send me um, or to give me tomorrow in writing amendments, things that they think are sensitive, things that they think should come out, things that they think should be even more strongly worded, uh, things that they feel are unclear, all of those things. You, you tell me how you want this shaped, and I will try to do that during the day tomorrow so that by the end of tomorrow, we have a final version which we can look at and see if we're content with that. And we'll try and sort out why things I do on my Apple don't appear on screen with the same bright red, which is what I did all the changes in. Um, but, but now it'll be over to you. I mean, it might be worth if there are any initial comments, um, listening to those, if that's all right, Chairman. No, this was brought around this morning, a six-page document that was put on every desk this morning. And it says, first draft of a communique. Has everybody got it? Questions? Comments? Are there any questions? Yeah. We would like to study on this document. And please give your feedbacks during the day tomorrow. We will have a chance again 40 minutes tomorrow afternoon to discuss on the communique. And we will decide on the final version tomorrow. Thank you, Professor yeah. Nathanson. Yeah. But again, you know, come, to, come up to me. I'm sitting at the front tomorrow. If you think there are things that you want to change, let's try and do some of those during the day. And then at least we can ask the group, you know, this has been suggested as a change. Do you agree or not? Because um, that makes it much quicker to go through the section in the, in the late afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.